Okay, so it's time to get out your manuals because what we're gonna do are visual diagnosis challenges. These are really fun. So it's eight cases total that we're gonna cover that deal with some things that are sort of um, visual stimuli that you can look at. And I'll tell you how to do this. So open it up to the visual diagnosis challenges, part one questions. So don't cheat. We have all the answers in there. You can go ahead and look at it later. Don't cheat. Um, but we're going to go through these cases together. And I want you to kind of think about what we're doing when we do this. And we'll go through the teaching points and I'm asking you cl clinical questions and sort of think about what you would do if you were taking care of this kind of patient. So let's start. Case number one is a two-year-old boy who presents with periods of listlessness, a loss of appetite, and intermittent bouts of what, what looks like severe abdominal pain throughout the day. His parents bring him into the ER, um, and the, now the father's finally home from work, so they can bring him into the emergency department. And the par parents say he really hasn't been himself all day long. He just hasn't act acted normally. He hasn't had a bowel movement, but sometimes he skips those. And he's urinated twice, so that's actually normal for him. Um, he's previously completely healthy. His vaccines are up to date. He had a primary care visit last week. Everything was great. Um, when you look at him, he looks kind of tired. He looks fatigued, um, and he really just wants to hang out in mom's lap. He just wants to nap in his mom's arms. When you examine him, it's really unremarkable. So there's really nothing on your exam that you find that's particularly alarming. And he doesn't seem to be in any pain. Um, and his abdominal film is what you see there in your manual. Now, if you take a look at that film, what are the findings that you see on that plain film? So what, what are the findings on that thing? So let's take a peek and see what we think. So if I look at that x-ray, now we don't really look at belly films of kids that much anymore because we just don't really image kids that much anymore. But I look at that film and the things that my eyes are drawn to or it's like, hmm, what's that sort of sausage-shaped air pattern on that left lower quadrant? Is that anything I need to worry about? And then if you look really closely, what you really notice is that in that right upper quadrant, kind of overlying the liver, there's kind of this denser area with a lucency in the middle. It's like, what the heck is that? What is that? That is so weird. And what is it you're worried about in the first place? So if you see a kid who has listlessness, a kid who has bouts of abdominal pain, who's sitting kind of just doesn't really want to hang out with, just hangs out with mom, not doing much, may or may not have had a bowel movement. I know the thing that comes really to the top of my mind is intussusception. So if that's the case, what are the findings on x-ray, on a plain film that might lead me to be worried about intussusception? So I'm going to go back and look at this film. And I know what I want to look at are pathologic bowel gas patterns. And this kid has a lot of air in there. I'm not sure it's completely pathologic, except, you know, that right upper quadrant thing is weird. It's that whiter density with the sort of the lucency in the middle of that. What the heck is that? And that worries me for intussusception. Now, there are other signs that you can see on plain foam with, with intussusception, things like a paucity of bowel gas, um, gas in the wrong quadrants, um, basically a crescentic pattern that shows you where they actually have the intussusception. Coffee bean sign sometimes is there. But this kid has a couple of things that worry me and, the, and a clinical history that definitely worries me about intussusception. The classic presentation of intussusception is this sort of listlessness with intermittent bouts of severe abdominal pain, kind of crying out. But do I just know that the, even though this child is listless, it turns out that not every child is listless and don't count on that. They may just have these intermittent bouts of abdominal pain and it tends to happen in kids that are 3 to 36 months of age. So that's the group that this tends to happen in. So if you're worried about intussusception and you have this particular film that looks a little funky and what's that thing in the right upper quadrant? What else could you check for in this kid? What else could you sort of do on exam? I know when I learned about intussusception, I was taught to basically do a rectal exam. You're taught to, to look for those current jelly stools, for the stools that come out where the kid is actually necrosing that bowel. But that is a really late finding. And kids really hate rectal exams. And there's not a lot of data that doing a rectal exam really changes anything that we do. So you can argue not to do a rectal exam at all, um, in this child, in any child, basically almost, but particularly this child, because it isn't something that necessarily helps you, um, and it's really, really uncomfortable for the kid. So, what's the cause? If this is a deception, why do kids get this? Well, we know it's an invagination of, of the sort of loop of bowel invaginating into the more distal loop of bowel. It kind of gets peristalsed into that distal loop of bowel. Rarely it's from a tumor or something that's actually causes a little nidus for it to invaginate on itself, but most of the time it's just random. We don't really know why. One of the things that was bandied about for a while is the rotavirus vaccine. So there was some tying initially to the rotavirus vaccine and increased risk of intussusception. That has been, so, and it's about one in 20,000 to one in 100,000 kids with intussusception will have had a recent sort of rotavirus um, vaccine. 
it looks though like that there's there's not really a correlate that the vaccine causes the the um, intussusception, and even if it does on those rare rare occasions, it has really decreased the um, the diarrhea rate in children. So you know risk benefit sort of balance here. If it's tied at all, it's tied rarely, and the vaccine has really decreased the risk of diarrhea in kids. So kind of on balance, it seems that the vaccine has been helpful and, and not particularly harmful, and may not even be tied to intussusception. So you decide that you're not exactly sure for this kid, and what you really want to do is get an ultrasound. So you decide to perform an ultrasound, and you see what is on the next picture. And that next picture shows that little donut-y thing looking in the middle. So this kind of donut thing, you can see the abdominal wall at the top there, and sort of the fat layers in there, and then you're into peritoneum, and there's that donut thing in the middle. So does this finding support or refute your diagnosis of a disception, which is what you're worried about. And the reality is it, is it supports it. That's called the donut sign. And that's a transverse view of the two, the loop of bowel going inside the, the more distal loop of bowel. So it's, it's basically that telescoped version. And if you were to turn your probe and do it longitudinally instead over that area of bowel, you would basically see the four lines of the loops of bowel inside each other. So you, on the sagittal view, you'd see this the segment one inside the other. So th this is most, if you're doing ultrasound, this thing is most commonly found basically the, where intussusception most commonly occurs, which is distal ilium into ascending colon. So you tend to see it on the right side, sort of on the right gutter area, or even up in the right lower quadrant. So if you do it, or right upper quadrant. So if you do it, that's where you're gonna wanna do your ultrasound because that's where you're gonna look. And then how do we treat intussusception? Well, there's, you're gonna call a surgeon for sure. Um, and they used to, years and years ago, operate on all of these kids. But it turns out that they don't necessarily need operations. In fact, most of them don't. What tends to be done in these children is an air enema. So they basically will put air in and, and blow back that sort of invaginating part, portion of the bowel to basically reduce that intussusception. And if that doesn't work, or if it recurs right away, or if there's a perforation or other complication you're concerned about, those are the kids that go to the operating room. Most of them basically don't need it. They need just an air enema. Most resolve quickly, and they don't recur. So most kids do just fine. So that's kind of an interesting plain film of intussusception with an ultrasound in a kid that has that disorder. All right, let's do case number two. Case number two, a 38-year-old female arrives by ambulance after onset of right upper extremity and right facial weakness one hour earlier. She states that she was alone when it occurred, but she called a nurse friend who came right over, and then they called an ambulance. Her friend says the weakness looks like it's getting worse to her, and on your exam, she definitely has hemiparesis that involves the right upper extremity and face. It spares the forehead, which makes it central, and she has no other neurologic findings. As you do in possible strokes, you calculate your NIH stroke scale, and you find it's a five. She gets two for a right upper extremity weakness, two for facial weakness, and one for slurring. The patient states she first noticed the right side of her field of vision go dark initially. So she had a visual field cut initially 90 minutes ago. Then she noticed weakness in her hand about 65 minutes ago. And, and then it's been gradually going down to her right upper extremity and her face. She says she has a headache, but no subjective feelings of confusion and no difficulty with word finding. Her medical history, she has an IUD, a distal history of lymphoma a long time ago when she was a teenager migraine headaches, hypertension, and her primary doctor's been watching all of this and basically just treating that with lifestyle, uh, like particular hypertension with lifestyle changes. She takes no medications regularly, and her vitals show her blood pressure is 178 over 112, pulse is 92, respiratory rate 12, normal sat at 98% on room air, and a finger stick of 88. You send her to the CT scan, and that's her CT scan right there for you. So in your book, you see that particular CT scan. So, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Her initial labs are negative, and while she's in the scanner, the radiologist calls you because you sent it over as you know, worried about code stroke, and the patient says, nope, it's generally negative, but you know, in that left temporal region, I see some possible changes that might represent some cortical edema. So that's your radiologist read, that's what they're giving you. So, now what? What's your next step with this 38-year-old person with an NIH stroke scale of five who is weak on one side and seems to have gotten progressively worse? The big question here is, do you lice her, right? We all are in this code stroke mania, and we, we run to lysing people. But take a step back one second for her. And you wouldn't be wrong to do it. You wouldn't be wrong to do it. At least up until recently, you wouldn't be wrong to do it. But there are a couple red flags that tell you something's not right here. So she's young. She's 38, kind of young to have a stroke. She has a history of migraines, which makes you wonder, could migraines be causing some of this trouble? And she has a headache. Most strokes, or at least a lot of strokes, don't cause headaches. So that doesn't quite fit. So there's no concrete right or wrong. You just basically have to decide the risk of harm, the benefit, any red flags, and so where do you come down on this? 
Is there a formal endorsement on what to do for her? Now, what is fascinating is that until October of 2019, we definitely had a formal thing that we're supposed to do, which was to lice her. The stroke guidelines that came out last year, within the last year or two, are very aggressive on lysing people. Um, in fact, it's basically kind of written in as standard of care for lysing people. And she's someone you would have considered lysing until October of 2019. What happened in October 2019 is the PRISMS trial came out. It's a randomized controlled trial looking at people just like her, who had an NIH stroke scale that was small, so five or less. So this is actually a small NIH. It's not a big, huge, gigantic stroke score. It's actually a low NIH stroke score. And what they found is they looked at comparing lytics to aspirin only. Um, and what they wanted to do was see what were their outcomes, both good and bad. Again, we're measuring harm versus benefit when we do anything at all, but especially with lytics. And what they basically found is that the, the outcomes were the same, aspirin versus lytics, as far as benefit, but there was a 3% symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage rate if you gave a lytic in these patients. So they basically they updated their guideline on stroke at the time and basically said if somebody has a, an NIH stroke scale of 0 to 5, do not lyse them. So they actually took lysing away in this sort of milder stroke group. And that's important to know because this is someone you could quite reasonably now, now that's after, uh, since the studies come out, not lyse. You could go ahead and not lyse her. So let's go back now because the radiologist said let the thing look like there was hypodensity and some edema. Let's go back and look at that scan. You know, if you really look at that picture, that is a normal brain scan. That's completely normal. There's no gray-white interface problem. There's no edema cortically anywhere. There's nothing. So why did the radiologist read that as a, you know, possibly this? Well, that's a cognitive error. That's one of the problems when you pre-populate someone's, you know, ideas of what might be happening in there. That's a cognitive error. They basically said, well, it's a person who might be a stroke. The, you wrote in what their findings were. They look at the CT scan and kind of overread it. So know that that can definitely happen, these cognitive errors when it comes to stroke. And it would have pushed you, if there really, really were truly changes, to consider lysing. But again, the PRISMS trial basically says, don't do it. Now, when she comes back from the scanner, so now she's come back, she's come back from, she's, you see her again, she now is having trouble finding words. She has having word finding difficulties and she has expressive aphasia, mm, trouble, that's changed. But her weakness is better. So she now is stronger in that right upper extremity. Does that change anything? Well, now think about the strokes that you've seen. Strokes do a couple of things. First of all, stroke things tend to come on all at once. They don't tend to just have a little this, a little of that. And strokes don't get one part better, one part worse. That just doesn't tend to happen in strokes. So they, that's a, something really is not adding up here at all for this being a stroke. And if you go back to her symptoms, she had hemi, sort of a hemi um, visual field loss initially. We don't know if that's still there or not. We need to go back and examine to see. Then she developed motor findings. Then she developed some aphasia while her motor findings went away. And she had a headache. Hmm, let's cogitate on that. What could that be? And in the meantime, maybe an MRI is helpful. So if you order an MRI, you get an emergent MRI, here's what you get. So those pictures, I don't know about you. So MRI was, was basically discovered after I finished all my training. MRIs to me are this big, like crazy black box of fuzzy gray stuff and black stuff and I don't know what to do, except even looking at that one, I know that's not normal. Looking at that MRI. Basically, the MRI is read as cortical edema in the temporal parietal and occipital region that, co that correlates with her deficits. So it's her left side, it's her right side that's, that's symptomatic, so you know, it's her left side of her, of her brain. That all fits. So what is this? Her CT scan is negative. Her MRI basically shows this sort of edema area, this sort of cortical edema. Is she having a stroke? Not necessarily. What this is is somebody with a hemiplegic migraine. Now, the MRI shows the things that you see, venous engorgement with this hemiplegic migraine, the edema, and meningeal enhancement that goes with basically the hypervascularity that goes with the migraine. So MRI can be helpful in differentiating this. this and again, this, this um, hemiplegic migraine is an uncommon finding, but something that needs to be in your repertoire as a stroke mimic, and often accompanied by headache, like hers was. Again, strokes aren't often accompanied by headache unless it's hemorrhagic, not dry strokes, but hemorrhagic strokes might. She doesn't. So she had kind of a classic presentation. She had an aura. She had some neural findings. It was gradual. She had some weakness. Her weakness went distal to proximal, hand first, and then her arm. That's also pretty typical of this. Stroke doesn't do that. Remember, stroke is like everything all at once. It's a clot that's happened in there, and it's everything all at once. So that's what's more common in the stroke. Now, what's the typical clinical course? So if she really is a hemiplegic migraine and not a stroke, what's her clinical course going to be? Well, typically, these are self-limited. 
over time, it can be hours, sometimes even as long as a day, it takes that long for everything to come back. And everything usually does come back completely because this is not an occlusive problem, right? This is a perfusion problem. There's no clot that's the problem here. Lysing isn't gonna change a thing because it's not a clot that's the problem here. So basically these people will reperfuse themselves on their own. This basically migraine thing, they'll reperfuse on their own. Lytics don't particularly change that. So treatment, for this is again, not lysis, not even really aspirin. There's no proven therapy to make this better, but you can use things like calcium channel blockers. You can use antiemetics that'll at least definitely particularly take care of the headache part of this. Have a neuro consultation certainly because this is a dramatic and scary thing. Um, and know that most people have complete resolution, but every once in a while somebody's gonna have a permanent deficit from this. So interesting case, the take homes of this one, remember this sort of distal to proximal progression of a stroke. That's not really a stroke that tends to go more with, with the hemiplegic migraine, the headache that goes with this, the one part getting worse and the other part getting better neurologically that goes with hemiplegic migraine things to remember. And please remember the PRISMS trial, somebody with a, an NIH stroke scale of five or less, they don't get lysed. Okay. Those people don't tend to do any better and they have some increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage. So that's that. Let's do case number three. It's a 51-year-old female with finger pain. She says she says she has redness and swelling of her left distal thumb, so left distal thumb, uh, developed over a week. It's worsening and becoming increasingly painful. She says, I'm a nail biter. I bite my nails all the time, um, although the picture shows a little better manicure than she probably does with her biting. Uh, and she said she's had this before. I've had this before. I've had this lots of times before, um, but usually it goes away in a couple of days. It hasn't lasted this long. Um, if I leave it alone or I sometimes soak it, it gets better, but this one's just lasted longer. I haven't injured it. I don't have any known trigger of this thing. And on history, she says, no, I'm a drinker. I drink every day. She says, I have high, I have high blood pressure, that too. Um, and I do take two antihypertensive pills for my blood pressure, but I don't know what those names are. I can't remember what they are. And I work as a logger. So she works outside in logging. So she gets home from her logging job, has a couple of drinks, and she does take her antihypertensives and doesn't know what those are. Her vital signs are fine. She's afebrile, but looks uncomfortable. And she says, my finger's really bugging me. My, my, my finger really hurts. It just hurts. Her exam shows redness and painful swelling at the base of the nail bed, and it's almost circumferential. So it's not just at the nail bed. It almost goes all the way around the finger. Um, and it looks like there's a skin break almost in that one area. And there's some yellowish material under the skin on that lateral aspect. It's really, really tender. It's painful when you move that fingertip and the rest of her exam is unremarkable. Okay, so it's a finger that's swollen, red, tender. Looks like there might be something under the skin in there. She's a logger, she's a hypertensive, she drinks, she's had this before, what's up with this? So let's think about a differential diagnosis. And honestly, the differential is pretty gigantic for this. Just, just you know, this could be a lot of stuff. It could be candidiasis, it could be herpetic Whitlow. Um, she's not in the right business for that, but she chews her nails a lot. So that could be perinicium, a felon, could be gout, could be osteoarthritis. She could have RA. Maybe this is a flare of RA. Maybe she has a neoplasm of that nail bed. Maybe there's something going on or a fibroma going on down there. Um, there's several things in this differential. So how do we figure out what's what? What do we do next? We see things like this all the time, right? You grab your scalpel. This must be a perinicia. We're just going to basically you know, fix that thing. Well, maybe not. Let's consider, oops, excuse me. Let's consider getting a plain film. Now we don't usually get plain films, right? But there are a couple of things about her history that make you kind of wonder. She's a logger. Could there be something in there that's an infection that I might be able to see? Did she get something in her skin maybe? Or she has had this multiple times before. Maybe this is something systemic that I, an x-ray might show me with. Maybe this is osteo. Maybe she's got that and a plain film might help me. So a plain film is gonna help me with maybe some things in the soft tissue, anything if there's a bony destruction or maybe if there's anything in the joint. Um, it's not gonna help me if it's something like a soft tissue infection, but it might help me with some of the others. So let's go ahead and get that plain film. So you have it there in front of you. What do you see on that plain film? Well, I'll tell you, if I got that plain film, I would be one of those, wow, I hit the jackpot. That is not what I would have expected to, on a plain film with somebody who had a finger look like that. What I see when I look at that are punched out lesions of both her, her around her DIP and her PIP. So these like eaten out moth eaten lesions. There looks like there might be some opacification along the flexor surface of that distal interphalangeal joint. Her soft tissues look kind of swollen and bulgy. What is this? What is this? This is, that's not your typical paranychia. That's not your typical felon. Something else is going on here. And, and that, to get that kind of punched out bony lesions, that takes a while. That's not just today. That's not even just this week. That's actually something that's been going on for quite some time. So now I'm in the probably systemic and probably something that's ongoing kind of bag of things to consider. That soft tissue thing, what is that? 
Well, if I look at that, maybe what that, see those little, little dots and all that soft tissue? What is that? Well, it turns out that this is gout. She has an acute gatty flare and all that jazz is tophaceous material. All that stuff that's in there is tophaceous material. It looks like an infection and you wouldn't be wrong to, to consider that an infection, but being kind of thorough and thinking it through, why would she have this multiple times over many years and what is, what's with that? Why is, and why is this lasting longer this time? Most infections wouldn't last this long. What's happening? That would, that's helpful and getting the film actually really helped you with this. So the plain film helped you. Are there any labs that help you? Well, it turns out getting a uric acid, that's tempting, right? If it's gout, maybe that's helpful. In an acute flare, it doesn't help you. It can be high, it can be low, it can be normal. It doesn't help you. Uric acid levels help long-term. They help sort of in somebody who might need something like allopurinol to keep the level down long-term when they're in a more steady state. When it's acute, that the level doesn't help you. So that doesn't particularly help. And the, question number five here is what's that yellow stuff? Well, it turns out that yellow stuff is topacious material. And if you were to open that up, you're you know, thinking you would get pus out of there. What you're going to get is like granular yellowish crud. It looks like sand, like bumpy sand. That's what that tophaceous stuff looks like. And for it to show up on the x-ray, like it does on that film, it needs to have some calcium in it, which also happens with people that have gout. So the question number six is, what's the management? What do we do to manage this particular condition? Well, first and foremost, if you're convinced it's gout and you're pretty comfortable, I would be at this point with this, don't open it. Opening it does absolutely nothing. It, it can predispose to infection. It doesn't help anything go away any better. So don't open it. And it may exacerbate the pain. You're going to go and treat her. Now, she's seven days into this. So you're going to treat her with anti-inflammatories. Um, that that was helped the most, usually non-steroidals. You could consider glucocorticoids, but not a lot of data on that. And something like colchicine, this is too late for colchicine. Colchicine helps in earlier sort of gouty flare issues. Not this is now a weekend, so it's probably not that helpful. And you want to prevent her from having future flares. So one of them is to go ahead when she's at a more steady state and have her primary care doctor get a uric acid level to see if that's something they can treat by giving her allopurinol. But the other thing to know is that it's probably worth going and looking what those antihypertensive medicines are for her. If that antihypertensive medicine includes a thiazide diuretic, those increase your uric acid level, and that may actually be what's predisposing her to recurrent gout. So this is an acute gouty flare. Your clues on this were she's had this multiple times before. It's been going on for a while. She has x-rays that show punched out lesions. You're going to manage her with her pain control and non-steroidals and get her referred. All right, so that's our first three cases. Let's do case number four. This is a 38-year-old pregnant woman, comes in with her seven-year-old son, um, she comes into the ED because he's had three days of fever, sniffles, cough, and a sore throat. She says he gets, you know, your eyes all the time, but he got his temperature up to 104.1 today, and that just scared her. He doesn't usually get that high. And she basically have heard kids get seizures when they get high fever, so she wanted to bring him in because she didn't want him to have a seizure. She says he hasn't had a rash, no behavioral changes, no breathing difficulties, no changes in his appetite. And when you look at him, he appears pretty well, uh, but he does have vi a viral illness and a little bit of a cough in his sneeze. He's warm when you touch him, and he has a temperature of 102 when you measure it with a heart rate of 108. His lungs are clear. He doesn't have a rash. He doesn't have anything in his belly, no hepatosplenomegaly, no abdominal tenderness, and is otherwise remarkable except when you look in his throat. And when you look in his throat, you see what's on that picture. So what does that oral exam show? Well, a couple things on that picture. You definitely see these kind of erythematous and almost petechial changes on his soft palate way in the back. And it doesn't show very well in this picture, but if you look up close in his left cheek, you see little white spots in his left cheek. Okay, so that's what we see on that exam. So those little white spots in his left cheek and those little sort of hemorrhagic things back in his petechia. And it's a little bit red back there. So it looks like he definitely has a sore throat. Something's cooking back there. When you look at that and you see those little white spots, you see those hemorrhagic things on his soft palate, you basically show that, see that his throat is red. What other questions do you want to ask? And what this really focuses on is what are those little white spots? Those little white spots should strike fear in you deeply because those little white spots are coplex spots. And what this basically is, it goes with measles, which is rubiola. And that is a true public health emergency. And this case is brought up because we've had cases of measles in the last 24 months, actually 12 months, in the United States, enough that there are little outbreaks around the country, enough that you need to be aware of this particular disorder, and it is extraordinarily contagious. So it's really important to pick up on this, to be aware of what those findings show. So you're going to go back and you're going to ask certain questions, like, 
have you had ha is he immunized does this little boy have his immunizations up to date has he been immunized for measles mumps and rubella did he get his mmr has he been exposed anywhere has he been exposed did, did you did they travel to europe there are some european countries that don't vaccinate all their children and did he pick it up there has he been to some place like disneyland which is where some of the outbreaks um, happened of measles recently in the united states so you're going to want to know where's he been in the last two weeks what his exposures have been, you know, who's he been around? Um, you're going to want to know, is he immunized? So very, very important to find out sort of what this exposure history is. And if, you, if it is the measles, what can you expect? So to understand sort of what measles is, the clinical course of measles. So first of all, it has a seven to 14 day incubation period, which is why you're going to ask where he's been for the last two weeks, because he got exposed sometime in the last two weeks. When they develop symptoms after the seven to 14 day incubation period, they start with what are called the C's. Cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis are the most common. So they get a dry cough, they get basically runny nose, they look pretty miserable, they get a conjunctivitis, and they look kind of miserable. This kid doesn't look terribly miserable, but they tend to look pretty miserable. They often have a sore throat, and their temperature can go as high as 105 when they're early on with, with the measles. The rash doesn't start until a little bit later. So the C's start first in the sore throat and the fever, and the rash tends to start two to four days later or three to five days after the symptoms start. So this is one where symptoms begin and then the rash starts later. And the rash basically is a flat red blanching rash. It starts centrally, usually around the face. So if you see this kid when the rash is starting, their face starts to get kind of blotchy and red. And then again, it blanches, it's macular. And then it goes down to the trunk and out to the extremities. Um, it goes on the neck, et cetera, on its way down there. And it can coalesce. So this, and they, boy, when you see a me measles rash, it's something that, that sticks with you. It's something you don't tend to miss. And if the child is lucky and they resolve with this thing, it tends to resolve in three to seven more days. So their total illness period is about 10 to 14 days. And that's after having been exposed about two weeks before they even develop symptoms. And the worry we have with measles for, this, for, the, for the patient themselves is that it has a fatality rate. This is not something that is not fatal. So anywhere between one in a thousand and three in a thousand children will die of the measles itself. And there are complications in those who survive. They'll get encephalitis in one to a thousand cases. They can have respiratory and neurologic complications that can lead to death. And then there's a, um, the other thing that's kind of scary about measles is that uh, seven to 10 years after the measles episode, when they get an active measles infection, they can get subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. So your kid that's doing great, they got measles when they were four and they look fine. When they're 11, they get basically neurologic abnormalities. They can basically go get comatose, they seize. It's actually pretty devastating. So the, again, fatal, fatal rate is one to three in a thousand. And then a certain proportion of kids will have complications going down the line. So if that's the case, if you think this kid might have measles, what's your diagnostic next step? What do you do diagnostically? Well, a couple things. You're gonna to wanna to test the serum for IgM for measles. It's not IgG yet, it's early, right? They're symptomatic now. So you want the IgM for measles, and then you can also th swab that throat and look for a PCR for measles. So they can do PCR testing for RNA, the RNA of measles. And then you can also sometimes do a urine test for the um, RNA as well, for the PCR as well. But it's a blood IgM and a PCR for the virus itself of the throat. Now, this kid had those the sort of red spots in the back and maybe this is strep. You could consider testing for strep, but if you see those complex spots and you're worried about measles, it's measles till proven otherwise. The measles tests are paramount and the child needs to be treated as if they're an infectious measles case until they prove that that's negative and then you can consider strep. You can go ahead and treat for it if you want to, but the reality is you're gonna to have to treat this as a public health emergency. So measles is with 1,300 cases in 2019 alone in the United States. And it is considered a public health emergency because this is a truly aerosolized virus. This thing is tiny, tiny, tiny it floats in the air for quite some time and it is highly infectious. So it is a big problem. So what you end up doing, and, and we had several cases at the hospital where I work, and what you end up doing, it is onerous to track this down. Because what you need to do is basically have anybody that this kid came in contact with or was in the room with for any period of time get tracked down. So if you have this child sitting in your waiting room, and they're out there coughing and what, the, this little aerosolized virus is something that anyone in the room can pick up because they're infectious while they're symptomatic. Terrible business. Now you can be in, infectious from four days before the rash to four days after the rash. And remember the rash doesn't occur until after the C's start, usually three to four days. So usually this is not transmitted asymptomatically. It's once they're symptomatic, but they can transmit this even in that I have a cold stage and the rash hasn't happened. 
So that's really important. Anybody who's been in the room with at any point in the last few days needs to get evaluated um, formally to see if they've actually had this test. So they get tested for either immunity if they've had the vaccine. So you can test like all of you who work in healthcare have usually had your MMR done um, to, to see if you're actually positive for measles um, antibody. And then if they have been exposed, they need to be quarantined and perhaps treated. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, what should the family think about? What should the family consider? Well, a couple of things. First of all, they should all get immunized if they're not. So immunization is important. And the person that is the most important for is mom. Mom is pregnant and she is now exposed to measles, which can be devastating for her unborn child. So she, if she doesn't have immunity, if her blood tested and, and, and pregnant women get tested for measles, um, the measles antibody, if her po test is not positive, she needs to basically get immune prophylaxis for this to basically prevent exposing that fetus to measles itself. And then anybody at home needs to again, get, get evaluated and either immunized or tested to see if they're, if they're um, uh, immune, if they have the antibody. So measles. We're all up to speed on aerosolization of all kinds of viruses these days and know that measles is a true public health emergency and that people, kids with measles basically need to get isolated, all their exposures need to get tracked. IgM antibody is the way to test, to check it. Also PCR looking for the virus itself and exposures need to be evaluated. That's measles.